Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk. I, uh, I'm not presenting new work done by my own, but I want to give an overview of, of databases and descriptive complexity theory and the kind of descriptive complexity um, that we'll do today in this talk is the old fashioned style. So without uh, updates, uh, just the, the static setting that's also the one that, that's common in complexity theory. And um, I follow a tradition of, of this series of talks, so I use this <laughs> tiny URL, and you can find the, the slides here at ep minus descriptive. I didn't want to use databases because I had the feeling the first word databases doesn't describe it as good as descriptive does. Um, so I, I named my two parts, uh, I, gave, I didn't change the title, but I gave subtitles. <laughs> so, so the first part will be about how to express computations with logical formulas. And for me, logical formulas are equivalent to, to database queries. And we will see different kinds of formulas here and I will um, at the end of this first part, I will give you a, a, a long exercise on how to write data log programs. So if you're not familiar with data log now, I'm sure that at the end of this first talk, you either will be or you will know that data log is not the kind of thing that you're fond of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and these two parts. So the second part is on how to prove uh, limits of expressibility of certain logics. Um, and the two parts are not necessarily uh, exactly the two parts in the program, so maybe I'm a bit quicker on this one and a bit uh, slower on the other one or the other way around. And um, I have no intention of showing all the slides to you. So what, what my intention is that you, you can follow what I explain here, so please ask questions. I would rather only cover half of my talk, but make sure that most of you have understood what they wanted to understand. Uh, than showing all the slides without anybody uh, listening anymore in the end. Okay, so in this first part, it's on how to describe computations by logical formulas, so descriptive complexity. Um, and I will first give an, an overview of what descriptive complexity is about, and then we will look at how data log can uh, can describe computations. And the first part on data log we will see is that data log is poor, poorly expressive. So in, in German we have a, a saying, when, when you say this person cannot count to three, then you want to say this person is really dumb. Um, data log cannot even count to two. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you have a different look at data log, it's highly expressive. It's, uh, its uh, data complexity is, is p time complete, its combined complexity is x time complete, and we will see a proof of that. Um, it's, uh, it can express all p time computations when you have the right view on, on data log. Okay, so let's start with an introduction on descriptive complexity. So, um, yeah, it's, it's about databases, but for me, graphs are the simplest examples of databases. So often I will talk about graphs, but everything that I say about graphs also holds for databases. And for me, um, graphs are finite, so every, every structure will be finite in this talk, are finite and directed. And sometimes I draw pictures where you have edges like this, then I mean you have the edge in both directions. So when u and v are nodes of the graph. Um, and of course, I can represent graphs by databases in a straightforward way. And just to, to fix notation, if G is a graph with nodes V and edges E, then I represent this by a database. I call it I, like in the Alice book. Uh, so the database instance I that represents graph G has schema uh, V and E. So you have the unary relation and a binary relation and the uh, Unary relation is, is just the set of nodes, and the binary relation is the set of edges. So that's straightforward. 
And now, what is a graph property? So for me, a graph property is, is something that cannot distinguish between isomorphic instances of two graphs. So uh, formally, we say P is a set of graphs. And P will be called a graph property if for all graphs G and H, we have that if G and H are isomorphic, then G has this property if and only if H has this property. <coughs> On the other hand, when you, when you deal with algorithms, you always have to input some representation of the graph. And this representation has an order. If you, if you do uh, uh, adjacency matrices, you identify the nodes with the numbers 1 up to n. And on the numbers 1 up to n, you have an order. But then when you want to do a connectivity check, of course, you don't want the outcome of this check to, to depend on which way you chose to identify the nodes with the numbers. And so in some sense, every time you deal with algorithms where you get graphs as input for an algorithm, you deal your, your input really is an ordered graph of the form where you have vertex set, edge set, and you have some linear order. And um, what I assume here that this linear order is a linear order on the set of vertices. And if you have this adjacency matrix representation, when you identify your nodes with numbers 1 up to n, you, you have a natural linear order. And your algorithms always refer to this linear order. So when, when you do a connectivity check, you say, take the next node, take the next edge, and, and next is defined with respect to the particular order in which you get the input. OK, so that's an ordered graph. But what we want is, well, really, we get ordered representations of graphs, but we want to, to, uh, to think about graph properties and not about properties of ordered graphs. So you really, a property should only depend on the edge structure of the graph and not on the way you represent it. But at some points in this talk, I will also talk about properties of ordered graphs. And what does that mean? Well, you get an ordered graph. These are relational structures. And you say that if two such ordered graphs, so two such relational structures are isomorphic, then the first structure has this ordered graph property if and only if the second one has. And what's the catch here? Well, if you have a linear order on the vertex set, um, there, is not th there is no automorphism except for the trivial, trivial one. <coughs> so, so this here on, on ordered structures, um, things often are much easier than on, on general structures. OK. So I want to, to mention here the two seminal results in descriptive complexity that everybody has to know who works in the area. There are lots of, of, of further seminal results, but Fagin's theorem is something that, that everybody should mention when, when he or she speaks about descriptive complexity. So what is Fagin's theorem about? You have existential second order logic. That's formulas of this form. You have an, an existential block of quantifiers, and you quantify over, over relations. Relations have arbitrary arity. And after this quantification, you have a first order formula which uses the, um, the edge relation of a graph and which also uses these relations that you have existentially quantified. And now Fagin's theorem tells you that NP, so non-deterministic polynomial time, is captured by existential second order logic on graphs. What does this mean precisely? So for every fixed existential second order sentence, let's call it phi, of the signature where you just speak about graphs, on input of a graph, it can be decided non-deterministically in polynomial time if the graph satisfies the sentence. And how do you do this? Well, you just, you just non-deterministically guess these relations, and then you, you verify. Now the, and, and we often call such results, we say the data complexity of model checking for existential second order sentences is an NP. And now the, the interesting part of Fagin's theorem that is that you also have the other direction. So for every property of graphs, that is decidable in NP. 
there is an existential second order sentence that speaks about graphs such that a graph satisfies the sentence if and only if a graph satisfies this property. So if we would agree that NP is a right complexity class for, for characterizing tractable things, then existential second order logic would be a perfect query language. You would um, you could give this to a user, you, you are guaranteed that the user only can pose queries that are tractable in our model of tractability, and you know that all tractable queries can be posed by the user. Now, unfortunately, MP is not exactly what we regard as tractable. Um, so we, ideally, we would look, like to have a, an analogous result for polynomial time. And ah, and here, so um, <coughs> from now on, I, I will sometimes say every NP property of graphs can be described by such a sentence. So that's the second part of the statement. OK, so what about polynomial time? Um, we have the Immermann-Wadi theorem, which gives you exactly such a characterization, provided that you're working on ordered structures. So what is this theorem about? So I, I write LFP for least fixed point logic. Um, often in the papers you also call it IFP for inflationary uh, fixed point logic. Um, I think Pierre in, in his talk on Monday wrote something like FO plus U plus. That's the same what I call LFP here. And uh, it's essentially it's first order logic extended by the ability to f define relations inductively. So the Immermann-Wadi theorem tells you p time is captured by this least fixed point logic on ordered graphs. And this ordered is, is important. So this means for every fixed, well, this here should be LFP, <laughs> for every fixed LFP sentence of the signature that uses the, uh, the edge relation and the linear order relation that comes with this ordered graph. Upon input of such an ordered graph, you can decide in polynomial time whether this ordered graph satisfies the formula. Well, that's almost trivial if you look at the definition of LFP. Um, but the, the second part of the statement is the interesting one, that for every property P of ordered graphs, that is decidable in P time, there exists an LFP sentence of, well, the signature. So the sentence also uses the linear order. Um, and a graph, an ordered graph, satisfies the sentence if and only if the graph has this property. So every P time property of ordered graphs can be described by an LFP mm -hmm. sentence. And later on in this talk, when I speak about data log, we will prove a variant of this theorem where I don't speak about um, don't speak about LFP, but about data log, and I don't speak about ordered graphs, but about suitable representations of strings by databases. So we'll, we'll essentially see a proof of, of this result. Now. One of the, the major open questions in finite model theory and descriptive complexity is, um, can we get rid of the word ordered here? And can we get rid of this linear order here? So, and, and this is called the quest for a logic capturing p time. So the question is, is there a logic L instead of least fixed point logic? such that the Immermann-Wadi theorem can be generalized to arbitrary graphs. So that you don't need a linear order in your formulas. And well, such a logic would be great as a query language. It would guarantee us that the user can pose all tractable queries, and it would guarantee us that um, he can only pose tractable queries. So that's something that, that's very desirable. And this, this question for a logic in P time that um, in some formulation occurred from Chandra and Harel in, in 1982. Later it was made more precise by Gurevich. And 
when posing this question, is there a logic for something? You have to think about, well, what exactly is a logic? What are the properties that I would a logic like to have? And if you just <coughs> use these two properties, you can easily find a logic which is completely useless. And, and we'll have a look at that in, in the next slide, or next two slides. So I, I want to, to make sure what this question means precisely. So what, what qualifies as a logic and what doesn't? OK, so um, let's say an abstract logic L. What is an abstract logic L? I, I want that for every signature, sigma, um, you have a set of L sigma sentences. So here I will just speak about sentences and, <coughs> and, and properties and not about queries. And, and signatures are, let's say, relational signatures. Um, and everything is finite in, in, my, in my talk anyway. So for every signature, I want to have some set which I declare to be the set of L sigma sentences. And then I want to have a mapping which associates with every such L sigma sentence phi a property P phi of sigma structures. What is a property of sigma structures? Well, it's something that's closed under isomorphism. So if two sigma structures are isomorphic, they either both have the property or they both don't have the property. And then, well, when we have the, uh, such a set L sigma and such a mapping which associates a property to every a sigma sentence, then I will write, well, for a sigma structure G, I will write G satisfies this sentence in the logic L if and only if um, G belongs to this property, or G has this property that we associate with the formula. OK, so abstract logics are in some sense everything. I, I met nowhere here I said something about things having to be computable. But that's something we would like to have for a logic that captures p time. And here I'm just speaking on, on capturing p time of graphs because I want to make life simple. Um, so what is, what is the uh, precise definition? So an abstract logic L captures p time on graphs if um, it satisfies three conditions. And the signature I consider here is just the signature for graphs. So the first condition is that the set of L sigma sentences should be decidable. What is this good for? So if I want to use L as a query language, I should be able to, well, if the user types in something, I would like to be able to, to check if this something is a query or if it's just nonsense. So that's what, what this first condition is about. So I want the, the set of L sigma sentences to, de to be decidable. So the second condition is I want that there is an algorithm B that associates with every such L sigma sentence phi a P time algorithm A phi that decides the property defined by phi. And what does this mean? So it means upon input of an arbitrary graph, this algorithm A phi decides if the graph satisfies this formula or the graph has this property associated to the formula. And I want the algorithm to decide this in P time. So what, what is this good for? So I can view this algorithm B as a query optimizer. So this algorithm B receives a query phi. And it does something with the query. And then it comes up with an query evaluation plan. And this algorithm A phi is the query evaluation plan. And then we use this plan to, to uh, evaluate the query on an input graph G. And we want a query evaluation plan to be efficient. And here our model of efficiency is P time. So the second condition in some sense tells you I want to have something like a query optimizer. It shouldn't optimize. It shouldn't uh, be required to, to give optimal results, but it should be uh, able to, to give tractable algorithms. And now the third condition is the one we had before, that I want that every P 
p-time property can be described in this logic. So precisely uh, what the three third condition says that for every p-time algorithm A that decides a graph <coughs> property, there should be a sentence phi in my abstract logic such that, well, for every graph G, we have the graph satisfies the sentence if and only if the algorithm accepts the graph. So this means, again, all p-time graph properties can be expressed in this abstract logic. So these are the three requirements. The first is um, syntax is decidable. The second is you, you have something like a query optimizer. The third is you can describe every, every uh, p-time computable graph property. Now let's have a look at examples. So uh, what I claim is that each of these three requirements is crucial. Um, yeah, what does crucial mean? Um, I want to give you examples for three examples for each of the requirements missing where we get something that's useless for our purposes. <laughs> so. Um, So let's first look at this third condition. And I would like you to give me a logic which satisfies the conditions one and two, but not the third condition. So what is the conditions one and two? Condition one is syntax of your logic is decidable. Condition two is that every formula can be evaluated in polynomial time. And even more, when given the formula, so you have an algorithm which, when given the formula, can produce a polynomial time algorithm for you. And the third property, which is the one that could be missing in our first example, <coughs> is that you describe, can describe all p-time properties. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy for questions, but this is an easy one. So I would yeah. be happier if, if yeah. somebody below 35 <laughs> <laughs> gives an answer. I have harder questions where I uh, <laughs> try to, to get back to the not older but senior people. <laughs> <laughs> so any candidates for, for a logic which satisfies the first two conditions but not the third? The empty logic. The empty logic, yes. That's true. It's decidable. Um, for every element in there, you can do whatever you want, but it can't describe all p-time properties. Are there other candidates? <laughs> <laughs> some where you can uh, at least describe some p-time properties. <laughs> FO. FO, that's a good example. Um, can you find one that's even more expressive? Yes, exactly. So that, that's the one I call LFP here. That's exactly this one. And um, <coughs> then uh, in the literature, there are many more logics like extending fixed point logic with counting and with rank operators and with whatever. And you get larger and larger or more powerful logics, but still you, for, for, for most of these people succeeded in proving that they cannot express all p-time properties. Okay, now let's look at the second case. So let's say I want a logic which satisfies conditions two and three, but I don't care about condition one. So something where the syntax might be undecidable, but where I can get an algorithm. So if, if somebody inputs me a, a formula of that logic and he guarantees to me that this really is a formula because I can't check that, um, then I want, a P -time, uh, I want an algorithm which by just looking at this formula um, produces a query evaluation plan for me. So uh, produces an algorithm that can evaluate the formula in polynomial time. Description of P-time Turing machine? Yes. Yes, yeah. but you... Yeah. you they So, so you, you can say my, my abstract logic is now the uh, programs of all Turing machines which describe polynomial time graph properties. Okay. 
they have to accept the draft property. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, and that, that's the, the thing you can't check. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So <laughs> um, you can say, as long as you guarantee me that your Turing machine uh, decides a graph property in P time, um, I can just use this to evaluate the query. Are there other candidates? So my favorite candidate is order invariant fixed point logic. <laughs> so you say, let the formula use the linear order. When there is a linear order, Imam Manwadi theorem tells you you can describe all computations. But then I want the formula to, to, uh, to describe graph properties. And this means that no matter how this linear order is, is uh, uh, so how the, gr the, the nodes of the graphs are ordered, as long as the, the unordered version of the graphs are isomorphic, um, both ordered versions should satisfy the formula or they both shouldn't satisfy. So that's a rough description of what order invariant fi least fixed point logic does. So, so for this, um, we know as, as soon as we have this linear order, Imam Manwadi theorem tells us we can describe all p-time computations. Um, I can just read this formula and, and transfer it into a, a query evaluation algorithm, but I, I don't have decidability of the syntax. Okay, so what the, what the optimizer does, he adds some arbitrary order and then he evaluates the formula. So the, the, so optim so, so the formula, yeah. order invariant formula, means the formula may use a linear order symbol and the so relations. The and the, the so so your formula is just like a formula in the in the Imam Manwadi. Yeah. It, it does. So 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 when you get an input graph, yeah. then you just say choose an arbitrary order on the on the vertices, okay. and then you evaluate the formula okay, so and. Yeah, okay. but, but my algorithm, let's have a, a look at this again. The algorithm in step two, so there are two algorithms. There is one algorithm B that's, that just takes the formula and that produces an algorithm A <laughs> that will be used for evaluating the formula. So there's algorithm B, which gets your uh, least fixed point formula, which has this linear order symbol. It produces an algorithm, so the, the trivial algorithm for evaluating the formula, and this algorithm will, will use this linear order symbol. But then when you start this algorithm on input of a graph, you first have to, to produce <laughs> some order, and the order invariance guarantees to you that it, it doesn't matter which order you produce. OK, now concerning condition two. So I would like to have an abstract logic that satisfies conditions one and three. This means this abstract logic has a set, uh, has a, a decidable syntax. I, 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 uh, uh, I, I don't see how you capture all the everything that is repeat time. It's not uh, Here? Yeah. Um, I use Imam Manwadi theorem. The Imam Manwadi theorem, let's see, where do we have it? Did you capture everything on every property on uh, on order graph? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're so so. We can discuss this in the coffee yeah. break. Yeah. Okay. So where are we here? So so is it here that this is undecidable? Order invariance is undecidable. Okay. So this yeah. is something one has to prove, right? Yeah, and, and that's, uh, <laughs> okay. um, that, that's by uh, uh, elegant reduction from Trachtenbrot's theorem. Re okay. You can prove yeah, that. Sure. <laughs> and if you look in Leonid's textbook, I think you find most of the things I'm doing here anyway. 
Um, okay, so now, now I'm looking for an abstract logic, L, which has a decidable syntax and which can express all polynomial time properties but where we don't have such a query optimizer. So, so I, at least I don't know if we have one. <laughs> 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 and um, so you, you proposed for this year, you proposed to take uh, descriptions of polynomial time theorem machines that decide graph properties. You do something very similar here. So what I, do I do? First, I, I observe that, well, there are only countably many Turing machines. So there are only countably many p-time computable graph properties. And let's say p0, p1, p3, and so on is a list of all these. So this is a list of all p-time computable graph properties. This list exists. I don't require this list to be recursively enumerable. If it was, mm -hmm. everything would be well, quite nice, but uh, I don't require this. I just want this list to exist, and I will work with this list. So what can I do? I can choose my syntax for the logic. So the logic mm -hmm. says, well, every natural number is a formula. And so here formulas look completely different than what we think formulas should look like, but it, it meets our definition of abstract logic. And of course, the set is decidable. You get an input, you decide if it's a natural number, and that should be fine. Now, what do you choose the semantics to be? In abstract logics, um, I, I could just define the semantics saying for each number n, so for each formula n in my logic, and each graph g, I define that the graph satisfies the formula if and only if the graph has the property pn. And well, since this list is a list of all p-time properties of graphs, I know that all p-time properties of graphs are expressible. But if I want to use this as a query language, it's obvious that it's completely useless. So what we don't have, so we, we don't have an algorithm B which associates with every number n a p-time algorithm A n that decides this. And I don't claim that there doesn't exist one. I just claim that I can't prove that there is one. And I doubt that anybody in the room can prove that there is one, because then I think you would have solved this quest for a logic capture in Peter. And if you, if you don't like this definition of abstract logic, so, so for me, this doesn't look like a logic. <laughs> um, in, in model theory, there are concepts of what a real logic should look like, and then there are concepts of how to, to encode something like this in something that looks like a real logic, and, and also there you can uh, produce similar examples. OK. So let's move to something different. So we, we now have understood this quest for a logic for p-time is something that's worth uh, spending effort on, because you, you would get this query language that's at least theoretically beautiful. Um, and we have seen it's, it's not so easy. But uh, for these logics, you have lots of candidates. So something like this is not a candidate, but as, as soon as you have these three properties, we would be happy from a point of view of database uh, evaluation. OK, so let's look at one particular, and I call it logic. Data log for me is a logic or a query language. Um, and we, we saw data log already on, in Pierre's talk on Monday <coughs> very quickly. So I assume that you, you still have in mind what a data log program looks like. So you have 
um, a data log program is a finite set of conjunctive queries. And the nice thing is that you can use the head of one of these conjunctive queries in the body of either this conjunctive query or other conjunctive queries that are in this data log program. And then to evaluate this program on a database, you use, well, you have some relations in your program that refer to, to the database relations, and you have some intentional predicates that are the predicates that are in the head of some of the rules. These at the beginning are initialized with the empty set, and then you iterate in, in stages where you just evaluate all these conjunctive queries and enrich the, the IDB interpretation so you add tuples until things don't change anymore. So the standard example that you will see all the time is transitive closure. So if, if you, you look at, so if your schema is just the edge relation of a graph, um, then you can have a data log program which tells you, well, let's compute the transitive closure of the edge relation. This tells you if you have an edge from x to y, then this edge is in the transitive closure. Um, what else does it tell you? If you have an edge from x to y, and you already know that there is a path from y to z, then you add the tuple x to z into your transitive closure relation. And then when evaluate, so this here is a very short data log program. When evaluating this on a graph, you start with t being initialized as the empty set. And then you, you uh, go in stages where you, in the first stage, you look at, well, this rule and you add all edges into your relation t. This rule won't fire yet because you don't have anything in here. And then in the next stage, you um, this rule will fire and you will also add the, the uh, pairs that are connected by a graph of, uh, by, by a path of length two and so on. And you iterate this until you reach a fixed point. Okay, so you, you can express non-local things. So things that are far away from each other in the graph um, get close because they are connected uh, by a path. On the other hand, I, I, I would like to give you one or two slides giving you an idea on how poor the expressive data log is. And the, um, well, one powerful tool for showing that queries are not expressible is to show that queries are closed under homomorphisms. So for simplicity in this talk, my queries won't contain any constants. So this makes notation simple. Um, when doing a database theory course, I, I usually include constants because with them you can have lots of examples of real queries. But for, for doing proofs and, and introducing concepts in such a short time as today, um, we, don't, we don't allow constants in queries. OK, now I have an arbitrary query Q of schema S. So schema means the database schema that you have. And a query Q of that schema is said to be closed under homomorphisms. If for all databases i and j, and all mappings H from the domain of potential database entries to the domain of potential database entries. The following is true. So if, well, I, I take my database I. I change all the entries in the way described by this mapping H. So if H tells you uh, replace letter A by letter B and H tells you leave letter B as letter B. Then this mapping here says take the database everywhere where there is an entry A, replace this for an entry B, and that's H of I. So if, if the database you get here is contained in the database J, and contained means every, every relation 
of h of i is contained in the respective relation of j. So if this is the case, then you have this here. What does this mean? It means, well, if you first evaluate the query on your original database i, and then replace the entries according to what h tells you to. So you first evaluate the query on the database i, and then you replace all occurrences of a by b, if h tells you to do this. And so what do I claim? This here is included in the query result of, of Q on J. And what is easy to see is um, that every data log query is closed under homomorphisms. Um, there is one thing I, I should add. That's something we also saw in, in Pierre's talk on Monday. A data log query consists of a program and a goal predicate. So this program here is an example of a program and a goal predicate well, it could be any of the <coughs> relation symbols occurring in the, in the program. And this here really is an, an easy exercise. You just look at how you define the semantics of data log and then you, you know that for, for conjunctive queries you have this and then you also have this for data. So what is this good for? Well, it's good for showing that data log cannot count to two and cannot do many other things. So <coughs> let's look at a few examples. Um, so the following queries are not closed under homomorphisms, and hence they are not definable in data log. Um, so the first example here is the query exactly one in R. So R is a relation in my schema. and I want the query to tell me if this relation contains only one tuple, or contains exactly one tuple. Um, well that's what I wrote here. So this query here should return yes for a database i, if and only if relation r has exactly one tuple. So why is this not expressible in, or why is this not closed under homomorphisms? So if you found all these definitions a bit tiring, now is a place to wake up and do some, something that's pretty easy once you, you understood what this is about. Well, well R is the relation. So you, you can, you can, so this this H can change names of entries, but it can. So I think this example here is one where you don't even need H. So let's let's try it. Let's say H is the identity; it doesn't change anything. Um, I is the database where in relation R, you have two tuples. T1, let's say R is unary and you have a tuple A and a tuple B. And uh, let's do this. And then J looks like that. Then what do we have? H of I is, is P. Yes, um, and H of I is included in J. Um, what is our query? So exactly one in R. Evaluated on i, well, that returns the answer yes. And how do we model this in in databases? It's the empty tuple. So I'm not sure um, in how much detail Pierre explained this on Monday. So that's that's the way you model yes for database queries. So you say the 
is Q of J, yes. And Q of I is no, is modeled by the empty set. <coughs> and now H of this is also the empty set. So H of this means take every tuple and replace it according to H. And so it's included. So this wasn't the right way of doing things. <laughs> so, so what else can we do? I, need, I think if you take H of the identity, I yeah. have one, 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 two, two, uh, the <coughs> Yes. So H is the identity. I is that. J is that. Then H of I is contained here. Q of I is yes. H of Q of I is yes. And so what happens? Q of I is contains the empty tuple. Now you take this tuple, you replace every constant that's in there according to H, so you don't change anything. So, so that remains yes. But uh, Q of J is no, and that's the empty set. And so we violate this here. Actually, I'm quite happy that I got it wrong at the beginning, to, s to see that you, you play around with things and you... OK, so, so this here is not closed under homomorphisms. What is with the not equal query? So not equal, um, I want this query to return upon input of a database i. Um, the set of all tuples A, B, where A and B are in the active domain of the database, but A is different from B. So what was the active domain of the database? That's the set of all constants that occur in the database. So, so instead of NEQ, I could just have written this. So date. What I claim here is that data log cannot tell two, the two elements apart from each other. So what do we do here? The thing we did before, exactly. So now you say H maps A and B to B. You say I looks like that, J looks like that. And then what was your? <laughs> okay. And um, so what do you get? You get Q of I is, well, just these two tuples, um, H of Q of I is the tuple BB because A is mapped to B and um, Q of J is empty. Okay, so you can't uh, express the two elements, so, so you can't express inequality. Um, you also, with a similar trick, you can, can't express that a graph is disconnected. So the query disconnected should return yes for a database I that represents a graph G, if and only the graph G is not connected. And so the idea here is, well, does anybody have an idea here? Even if what? I'm 
yes, everybody is allowed to, to talk here. <laughs> Is there a homomorphism that collapses? Yes, you, you could say I looks like this. H maps this on one, on one large and, or yeah, even easier, I is this. H maps this here and, and you're done. Yeah, that's much easier than my two circles onto one circle. <laughs> okay, and now finally this, this thing where I say data log cannot, cannot count to two, so the query at least two. This query should return yes for a database I if the active domain contains at least two elements. Yeah, same. And so the German speakers will will know this, this thing cannot count to three, cannot even count to two. So in some sense, data log seems very weak. Um, but now I want to convince you that data log is highly expressive. And um, how much time do I? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so what do I want to show you? I want to show you that data log can simulate Turing machine runs if you get the definitions right on, on what the input is. So, well, for Turing machines, they get as input strings. Um, and, well, for words W of some finite alphabet sigma, I want to represent such a word by a database, IW. And so for doing this, I want to, to, to choose a schema S that depends on the alphabet, and the schema should be good for our purposes. And you, you might be familiar with the concept on how you represent words as relational structures. So if you, if you use the linear order here, that's something that data log cannot make use of. So, so what we do here is, and before reading this, let's look, have a look at this example. So let's say our alphabet is ABC, and our word is AABA. And what's the database that represents this word? So what I say is that I give numbers to the positions of letters in the word. So what is the word? AABA. And I start counting from 0. So this here is position 0, 1, 2, 3. And the positions are the elements in the active domain of the database. And now what, what I want is I want one relation which tells me which positions the string has and which is directly right to which. So what, what I do here, I represent this by a graph where this here is the successor relation. And I want to know what min and max is. And I use unary relations for encoding this. And then, uh, just as I do it uh, when, when representing strings by, by relational structures, for every letter in the alphabet, I have a unary relation, which should contain exactly those positions that, that carry this letter. So since I have an A at position 0, 1, and 3, 0, 1, and 3 are the elements in relation PA. B is at position 2, so 2 is the only element in relation PB. And so I, I use P for predicate, or I'm not sure for what. But <laughs> um, and then I also have this, this relation encoding all the positions that carry the letter C, and well, that's empty for this particular string. Um, because data log, also with this homomorphism argument, you cannot tell if two elements are directly next to each other, or so, so you cannot tell if there is something in between, because you don't have negation. So, um, but what you can do when you have the successor, you can define the transitive closure so that you get a strict linear order.
Okay, um, and this here is the official definition which just tells you to, to do the same. But why did you not uh, put just lin the linear order as part of the structure? I it, it, it doesn't hurt to put it into the schema, but I can define it anyway. And so, so, so what I really need is the successor. So if you, if you add something else, that's fine. But if you add something else but omit the successor, that will cause problems when we want to use data log to simulate Turing machines. Because you have to, to speak about um, you're at this tape position and in the next point in time you're at the position to the right. And you don't want to skip some positions from one point in time to another. OK. So. What do I want to show you? I want to show you a simulation lemma. And this sounds very technical, and yes, it is. Yeah. But it's, it's worth doing this, because uh, from this uh, lemma, we get the Imma Manwadi variant for data log. We get uh, exp time hardness for query evaluation for data log. And we get, can get all other kinds of things by just using this as a black box. So. It's worth trying to understand what this says, because until the coffee break, I will just talk about this stuff. <laughs> and um, so what does the simulation lemma tell you? So it tells you for every deterministic Turing machine M, and let's look at the input alphabet of this Turing machine. Let's say it's sigma. So I pick a Turing machine M. I use sigma to, to denote the input alphabet, and I pick an integer k. So I fix m and k, and the simulation lemma claims that there is a data log program. I call this p for program, and it depends on m and k. This program has edb predicates. What is edb predicates? That's the predicates that, that you want the structure to have to be able to evaluate the, the program. So that's the, the, the database schema of the input database. And this, these EDB predicates should be exactly the predicates that we use to, to represent strings. Um, so I, have, I want to construct this data log program, which has a, a, a null array IDB predicate goal. So the goal predicate will just tell you yes or no. Um, and what uh, do I want? I want that the following is true for the query that I get from this data log program together with this goal predicate. And what do I, so I, I define this query, QMK. And what I want this query to do is that for every <coughs> non-empty word, W, the query returns yes on input of this word w, and I give this word w in its database representation that we just discussed. The query returns yes for this database representation of the word, if and only if upon input of this word w, the machine m stops in an accepting state after at most length of w to the k minus one steps. So this uh, this index k tells me how many steps I want to, to simulate depending on the length of the input string. And we will have a look at this lemma for some time. So um, let's first see what it's good for. Later on we will prove it, but first I want to see what it's good for. So one easy consequence of this here is that data log captures p time on database representations of strings. Why is this? So for every p time, for every string language in p time, um, you have such a Turing machine. This Turing machine has some bound on its running time, which is n to the k, and you you use this machine for the p-time property and the number k, which corresponds to the time bound. And then your data log program will simulate the entire run of an input word um, 
and will tell you if, if the input word is accepted or if it's rejected. And well, this here is exactly the variant of the Immermann-Wadi theorem that I promised at the beginning. So what else is the simulation lemma good for? You can prove that data block query evaluation is x time complete with respect to combined complexity. Now, how do we do this? This here looks completely li like as, as if it doesn't fit to x time. Because here you have the string and, and the k is, is some constant that you fix and so on. So you have to do a, a reduction that's not completely trivial, but it will fit on, on one slide. And we will do this now. Um, what I need for doing this is one additional statement of the simulation lemma. And this statement tells you, um, well, Upon input of this Turing machine M and this number K, I can construct the query QMK in time polynomial in K and the size of M. And here I mean a unary representation of K. OK, so how can we do this? Data log query evaluation is X time complete. And well, that, that it's in X time is uh, is an easy exercise when you just write down the natural algorithm for evaluating data log. And if you analyze this in respect to the, the input database and the input program, you will get something that's x prime. But why is it x prime hard? So, and I, the thing that I like about this proof is that I don't have to tell you, well, let's take this nice x prime hard problem and we reduce it. But here, you prove from scratch. So, so this here could be your first x prime hard pro uh, problem. And <laughs> so for proving x time hardness, what do we do? We fix an arbitrary problem L that's in x time. And we have to reduce this problem to data log query evaluation. So what is data log query evaluation? It's the problem where you get as input a data log query plus a database. And the data log query should be a Boolean one in our case. And what do we want? We want to uh, produce the answer of the query on the database. OK, so for x time hardness, we have to look at each x time problem. So let's say L is an arbitrary x time problem. We fix this for now. And what we want to find is a polynomial time computable reduction from this problem L to data log query evaluation. So what does this mean? For every word u, which I put as input for the question if it belongs to L. So for every word u, I construct a data log query q and a database i, such that this word u belongs to L if and only if, well, the query q returns yes on the database i. So that's what we want for, uh, such a reduction to do. So now to do this, I, of course, will use that the problem is an exp term. What does it mean? It means there is a deterministic Turing machine T and some number L such that on input of an arbitrary stri string U of length M, the Turing machine takes at most 2 to the M to the L steps to decide if the string belongs to L. So that this here is x time, m is the length of the string u, m to the l is the polynomial that's here in the exponent. OK, so our idea is, well, use the simulation lemma. For an input word u, so u is the input word for which, which I want to, for which I want to check if it belongs to l. I choose the query q and the word w, so this database will be the database representing this word, as follows. And, and all the, the, the interesting stuff goes in the reduction now. I don't have to do any, anything with data log anymore. I can just use this simulation lemma as a black box. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I, I have this Q 
Turing machine T. I modify this Turing machine into another Turing machine, which I call M. This Turing machine M completely ignores its own input. Instead, it writes U on its tape, and then it just simulates T upon input U. And so T here is, is fixed from the beginning. That's not something we get as an input. But so we, we have this, this Turing machine program. And it's easy to, to modify this program. You just add a few new states. You say, well, um, when starting the computation, just delete everything that's on your tape, and then write the string u. Well, you need as many new states as u has length. And then you just start the, the computation of your original machine. So producing this machine here can clearly be done in time polynomial in the length of u. Now we have to, to choose things right for the simulation lemma. So of course, this, I call this m because I want to, to be this the m for the simulation lemma. Now the simulation lemma told you uh, take a Turing machine m and a number k, and then it does something. How do we choose k? I say m is, so little m is the length of the input string u. I choose k to be m to the l plus 1. And this will be the k that I use as input for the simulation. Now, what else do I choose? I choose the, the string w that's mentioned in the simulation lemma, just an arbitrary string of length 2. And the database is the database representing that string. Now, if we look at the statement of the simulation lemma, this tells you, well, the data log query that I produce answers yes on input of string w if and only if the machine m accepts the input string w in at most length of w to the k minus 1 steps. That, that was just the statement of the simulation lemma. Now, what is length of w? That's 2. What is k? That's m to the l plus 1. So here we have 2 to the m to the l plus a little bit. And now, what does m do? We constructed m in such a way that, well, it ignores its input. It writes the interesting string u on its tape and then simulates the interesting machine T on input U. And now, here I have 2 to the m to the l plus 1 minus something. And I just chose something that's a little bit bigger than what I need as a time bound for my Turing machine T, because here you have these few steps at the beginning before the, the real computation starts. OK, and what does this mean? Well, T is your Turing machine that decides your problem L. So that's if and only if. Ah, that should be a U, U and L. Um, so, so this here is the, so modulo this typo here where there is a U. Um, this is exactly what I wanted to have. And now we have to make sure that this reduction is computable in polynomial time. And it is because, well, I can construct this machine m in, poly in time polynomial in the length of u. And then I can, the simulation lemma tells me I can construct this here in time polynomial in the size of the machine m and the number k. The number k is polynomial in the length of the input string, so everything fits together fine. OK, so we have proved from scratch that data log query evaluation is x time complete. Well, from scratch, not really. <laughs> um, I used the simulation lemma, so that's the thing we still have to prove. Um, but before doing this, let me point out two more things. So by, by a similar trick that we did just now, we can also show that 
data log query evaluation is p-time complete with respect to data complexity. So what can you do there? Well, p-time complete means for every fixed query it's in p-time and there is one query for which it's p-time hard. So what will this one query be? Well, you <coughs> take a universal Turing machine. So now I want to have one query for which uh, for which evaluating this query is p time hard. I choose this query according to, so let m be a universal Turing machine, which is sufficiently e efficient. So m is a universal Turing machine, k is just one, or whatever you like, you fix some k. And then, then you build your reduction in such a way that, that your machine, your universal Turing machine simulates your, your p-time property that you want to simulate. So there is a bit more work, but not really much more work. And you, you also add some padding into your reduction so that with data log you just use the simulation demand, that's it. So that's a, a nice exercise where there's something to do, but not much. And what you need for this is that well, there is a log space algorithm um, which upon input of a string w constructs the database iw. This is obvious. You just read the string and fill the, uh, the relations. Um, okay, and there is a fourth thing that by using the simulation lemma plus some extra idea, you can also prove that the bounded problem, boundedness problem for data log is undecidable. And so what is the boundedness problem? I think this was one of the few problems on static analysis that wasn't mentioned on Monday. Boundedness problem tells you, you get as input a data log program, and you want to know if there exists some fixed number, k, such that no matter how your input database is, um, your fixed point will be reached after at most k iterations. And this means in, in in reality, you could rewrite this data log program into some, um, s some relational algebra query, which is rather simple. OK, so the, yeah, using this plus some extra idea, you also get undecidability of boundedness. Yeah? Sorry? What's the input for a problem? No, you for the boundedness, for the boundedness yeah. problem, the input is a data log program. Okay. And the question is, does there exist a k such that? OK, so we see the simulation lemma seems to be useful for quite a lot of stuff. So how do we prove it? Um, how much time do I have? OK, so we'll start the proof now and maybe finish after the break. Um, so how can I prove the simulation lemma? So I say, I speak about deterministic Turing machines. And in this proof here, my machines only have one tape. This is single-sided infinite. So you have tape cells 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And well, for an input string w, I use the same numbering scheme that I used here. I call the, the letters w0, w1 up to wn minus 1, when n is the length of the string. For such a string, I want to simulate the first n to the k minus 1 steps of the machine. So simulation lemma tells you, let m be, be a machine, let k be a number, and then you want to simulate the first length of input to the k minus 1 steps of the machine. And I will use this, the same notation. I think Wim also used this yesterday, but maybe you shift it. So, so this n in brackets is the set 0 up to n minus 1, so the set of positions of the string. And this is exactly the active domain of our database representing the string. And now the, the idea that un is, is underlying all of these proofs where you, where you simulate complexity classes or describe complexity classes by, by logics. 
um, that's also in, in Fagin's theorem and in, in Immermann Wadi and so on. So the, the one basic idea is you use k tuples over, over the active domain or the set of positions of your string to represent numbers up to n to the k minus 1. And you do this in the obvious way. If you have a k tuple, and I, I write x k minus 1 up to x 0, so that's the usual way we, we read numbers. <laughs> um, set, such a k tuple represents the number. So the number represented by this tuple is just what you usually do when writing n re notation for numbers. And now the, again, this is the same idea as you have in the proof of Fagin's theorem and, and Immermann Wadi. So our data log program, so we want to construct this program PMK. It will use a couple of IDB predicates to represent configurations of the machine on input W. And we want to represent we want to represent the configuration at time step 0, 1, 2, up to n to the k minus 1. So what we use is one predicate head. Well, that tells you where the head is. And this is a 2k array predicate. And what is the intended meaning of this predicate? It, the meaning is um, a tuple. So the, this x bar will always be a k tuple. And y bar will also be a k tuple. So head of x and y tells you at time represented by x, the head of the machine is at tape <coughs> cell y. Then we have, for every state q, we have a k-array predicate, state q, uh, with the intended meaning um, <coughs> at time step x. So State Q holds for time step X when M is in state Q at time X. And you do this for each state Q. And in our model of Turing machines, I, uh, I model it in such a way that once you have accepted or rejected, you can't have any further transitions. So for me, formally, um, <coughs> I have something like halt, accept, and reject. And once you have done that, you won't change anything anymore. And of course, all these also count as states in, in this sense. And then we have another bunch of predicates for, for describing the, the content of the tape at each time step. Um, so for each tape symbol A, we have a predicate tape A. And the intended meaning of tape A x, y is that at time x, tape so y carries the symbol A. And now, since we decided to use k tuples, we can only represent numbers up to n to the k minus 1. So that's as far as we can go on the tape and in the time. OK, now we can have intended meanings what we like, but we, <laughs> we want to, to construct a data log program which makes sure that these things have the meaning that we want them to have. So we, we will do that on the next few slides. And in some sense, what I have on these slides, you can view it as an algorithm for constructing this, this uh, data log program. So we start from scratch with an empty program where you don't have rules. And then I will add rules for quite some time. And then we will be done and, and see if this program does what we want to. And at the beginning, everything is very simple. And at some point, we will see where we, we need this particular representation of strings and where we need the stuff so that data log can work with it. OK, so we start with the MP set. And our first step, we want to add rules to achieve the intended meaning at time 0. Maybe I can get a bit more space here. So what does this look like? Input w. So my tape looks like that at position 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1, n up to n to the k minus 1. These are the positions that I want to represent. So I have 
the letters W0, W1, W2 up to Wn minus 1. That's the entire input string. And then from there on, we have lo lots of blank symbols. And well, that's the end of the tape as far as we care about. And what is my starting configuration? The head of my machine is at the starting state. And so I add, the first rule I add is a rule saying at time zero, the head is at tape position zero. And that's the rule which does this. So you say, so time zero is just that all the axes are the minimal element which is the number zero. And position zero means all the y's are the minimal element. So that was easy. And means provided by your encoding. Yes. And so then you have something similar. You say at time zero, m is in the starting state q0. So what does this look like? Well, you say. Um, you are in state Q0. So if all the x's are 0, then you get this here. Then at that point in time, you are in state Q0. Now I want to say that at time 0, the tape position 0 up to n minus 1 carry the input string. So I want to describe. I want to describe this part of the tape. And here things start to get a bit more interesting. So how can I do this? So what are the positions 0 up to n minus 1? How do I encode these positions? Well, position i in 0 up to n minus 1 is represented by, well, you have i in the last position of the tuple and zeros before. Because the number represented by this tuple and n array representation is exactly i. And that's what what my, my rule here tells me. So this, this min of all the x's tells you I'm in time 0. And this here tells you, well, I have zeros at the y's on all these positions. And the last position, so how do we, what does this here say? So y0 is here, this last position. That's the position I care about. And this predicate says, at position i, I have the letter a. And that's what my string representation, my input, tells you. And we add this rule for every letter a in my alphabet, in my input alphabet. Now, what can we do about that part? And here things get more interesting. So what I now want to say, at time 0, the tape positions n up to n to the k minus 1 carry the blank symbol. So what are these positions? How do I encode? positions that are large. So positions i at least n are represented by what? <coughs> Not all <laughs> zero. Saying that it's not zero, you can say by saying it's the successor of something. 
on my slide. I don't do that because I need the linear order in the next few steps, so I can just provide it here. Um, but you could also have uh, uh, have done what, what you proposed. So, so what do I say? I say um, if you are at time step zero, ah, no, that's wrong. So, <laughs> so I should modify this rule here. You know what should be here. Here I, I would like to have something telling you um, that one of these y is is uh, not zero. So, so this here is nonsense. But you know what to do. Maybe you have to add k minus 1 rules, where, where you say for, for each of these positions uh, between 1 and k minus 1, you, you add something saying at this position it's not zero. OK, but anyway, uh, I will need the less later on. And the less we already observed is the transitive closure of, of the successor predicate. And that's by, by these two rules. OK, so now we, we have added rules modulo this, this flaw here. We have added rules for saying at time 0, everything is the way we want it to be. Now, in the second step, I want to add rules so that just to be sure this less is the is the transitive closure of the successor on each individual coordinate of the No, it's it's just it's just a binary relation. So I want to get a, a, the linear order on the active domain at the moment. We will do that okay. on the next slide. <laughs> At, at the moment here, it's just the linear order on the, on the active domain, or on the, the <laughs> position 0 up to n minus 1. OK, and in the second step, I want to add rules such that I get something like an inductive step, so such that if the intended meaning is achieved at time t, then also at time t plus 1. Um, and for doing this, I need to add auxiliary rules for reasoning about plus 1. So for small numbers, the successor does what I want to. For tuples, I need to, to create something that's a k array version of the successor. And doing this in data log is, um, you can do it with lots of rules. You can do it with fewer rules. I tried to find a way of, of doing it so that it fits on the slide. Um, <laughs> OK, OK, I'll just let this here, and after the break, we will talk about it. <laughs> OK, so after the break, we will continue uh, finishing this proof. So that's two more slides to go, and then we are done. So if you fell asleep now, um, it's, it's a quarter of an hour at most in the second part, and then we will look at, at non-expressibility results. So it's something completely different. OK, so I think we should continue. Um, so we're in the middle of the proof of the simulation lemma. Um, what did we do? We did the induction start by adding rules saying that at time 0, everything is fine. Now we, are in the, we want to do the induction step where we want to add rules that say if the intended meaning is achieved at time t, then also at time t plus 1. And on this slide, we have auxiliary predicates that we define. And um, so one thing I want to have is I want to have, well, if I have a tuple, a k-tuple, which uh, represents time t, then I want to identify the k-tuple, which represents time t plus 1. So we need to think about the successor with respect of K tuples, and that's something you, when you start thinking about it, you just write it down. So that's the rules we do here, and to do this with data log, um, if I try to do this directly for K tuples, I would add lots of rules and fill the blackboard and so on. So one uh, slightly more elegant way is that um, for each L between one and K, you add rules 
to do successor on L tuples. So for successor 1, so the successor of uh, one tuple is just defined by the given successor predicate. And then if you already have a predicate um, for successor on L tuples, you can do the successor for L plus 1 tuple. And for this, you add two rules. The, uh, that's these two rules. Um, the first rule says, well, if you want to do, if you have L plus 1 tuples, x and y, and you want to say that y is the next number compared to the number represented by x, um, you have two cases. One case is that um, on these positions, you have the highest number. That's the max of all these positions. Then if you want to add one, what do you do? You add a carry here. So this y will be the next larger element compared to x. And all these maximal elements will be the 0. And that's what this rule here says. And then the other case is that. Uh, well, you are not in this situation. And then you just say, well, look at the, the L tuple at the end. And you want the, the first bit be the same. And the, the last one, um, the y's are the successor of the x. So that's what I do here. And then I have this, this rule that in the head of a rule, I only can use variables that are in the body of a rule. And that's why I add this thing here saying xl can be anything that's in the active domain. And then I also need rules for defining the active domain. And that's pretty obvious. Um, an element is in the active domain if it's part of the successor relation or part of one of these unary relations. So for string representations, uh, one of these things suffice, but if you want to do it for arbitrary databases of that schema, this here does it. OK, and now what we also need, so now we can speak about this point in time and the next one by using this k-array successor. And um, what we also need to speak uh, is about inequality of tuples. So when I want to speak about contents of tape positions. I want to say at all tape positions where the head is not, everything is as it was in the, in the original time step. And how do you do inequality? So we saw that in general, you can't do inequality. That's in, in this data log is poor. Um, but here we can do it because we can use the k-array successor to describe a k-array linear order. And that's a strict linear order. That's just the transitive closure of the k-array successor. And then we say, well, two tuples are different from each other if the first is smaller than the other or the second is smaller. So if, if they are in the less relation. And that's one of the points where you, you really use that you work with these string representations so that everything is nice, that you can do any inequality. OK, now um, we add rules for describing the Turing machine um, transitions. So for every Turing machine transition, we uh, now add a bunch of rules. And well, let's consider a fixed state Q and a tape symbol A. And let's say that the Turing machine transition function delta tells you when you're in state Q and read the symbol A, then go in state Q prime, write the symbol A prime at the current position, and then move the head. And this M says move left, move right, or stay where you are. So what do we do here? So we are in this situation. We want to add rules describing this transition. So here in this rule body, we have a couple of atoms saying that at time t, and time t is represented by the tuple x, the machine is in state Q, so that's what we have here. At the time represented by the tuple x, the machine is in state Q. Its head is at position y. And on the tape at 
position y and time x, you have the symbol a. So this here means exactly that this is the rule to apply. And so x prime is the next point in time. That's what the successor tells you. And then what you say is, well, then in this next point of time, I'm in state cube prime. And to, to describe the tape content, here the body is exactly the same as, as I had before. So this body tells me that I can apply this transition here. And what does this transition mean? It means that at the next point in time, the tape content at the position where I just wrote something is the new symbol. That's the A prime that the transition tells me to write there. So and now what I have to add is rules saying that on all other tape positions, things, are, things haven't changed. And that's what, what this rule here says. So it, it says for if at time x I'm in, I look at tape position y prime, and this tape position is not the one where the head is at time x, and I can apply this transition here, then um, the letter that's at that tape position will also be there in the next point in time. And you add these rules for every tape symbol b. And then you also have to add similar rules for representing the head movement. So, so I say movement is 0 if it stays, 1 if it goes one step to the, left, uh, to the right, and minus 1 is to the left. And um, here you have a case distinction on what to do with this head. And that's just the same idea as we did before. OK, so now we have rules for starting off the computation and rules for doing the next computation step. So what does my, my simulation lemma say? It tells you um, something about a goal predicate. So the answer should be yes when the machine accepts within these n to the k minus 1 steps. So we just add one rule saying if at some point in time that I represent here, um, I get into the accept state, then I have reached my goal. And that's it. So this completes the, the construction of this data log program. And then if you want to verify that this program does what it should do, First of all, you have to correct the typos that I left on the slides. And then you, you can just do it by, by a simple induction on, on how we constructed things. And just for the record here, that, that's the, the slide we already saw. So that's the statement of the simulation lemma. And here are lots of things that you can prove easily, some directly. For some, you have to do something. But uh, you don't have to simulate machines again and again. OK, so that's all that I wanted to, yeah? Can I ask you about this point one with the theme and mm -hmm. uh, So that's about graphs, and this is about strings. And also, this data log is horn classes, right, with <coughs> least fixed points in, in so kind of classical logic terms. So what, so what more is there to do? With so so to be precise, so I, I stated Immermann Wadi as if it was about graphs. So Immermann Wadi really is about all structures over all signatures. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you represent structures by strings. Mm -hmm. And well, it's not about all structures, but about ordered structures. So you, you represent the structures by strings, then you simulate the Turing machine, and then you translate back. And, and that's something we did here. So if, if instead here I would like to have database representations of ordered structures, I could have represented ordered structures, and then there is just one 
little bit that I have to change. But this translation is exactly the same that you also do in the Imaman Vadi. And about the horn classes versus the first order? It's so, so, so it's simple to translate data log programs mm -hmm. into least fixed point logic. So if you have simultaneous least fixed point logic, you just write the data log program into such a, a simultaneous least fixed point operator, and then you know how to, to uh, turn simultaneous least fixed points into just ordinary, or simple least fixed points. So, so this tells you that even with data log you can describe computations and there is a straightforward translation from data log to least fixed point logic. Mm -hmm. And then Imaman Vadi tells you with least fixed point logic you just can do polynomial time computable stuff and then you get from there to data log. So if, if you want to you can view this as a translation from least fixed point logic to data log on ordered structures. Yeah, because it's a weaker logic which still can, can describe everything you want. That's a good point, another selling point for, <laughs> for doing it with data log. <laughs> so what I like is that you don't have to mess with the, the syntax of least fixed point logics because data log, I find it quite easy to learn and least fixed point logic, it's quite easy to write short formulas that do something nobody can read. <laughs> It's use, uh, for all, I mean, I don't know, but you could use an Imaman Vardy a lot more, right? Then you can yeah, but, but here you see you don't need it yeah. because you still can, can simulate the machines. Mm -hmm. But what you need in both is that you have this, this linear order or the successor on, on your structures. 